confess in front of me and choose to you could do, briefly say what you did. Um, and then we'll see if the conversation starts. If not, I will I'll throw some questions. If not, you can raise your hand. And we've got an hour, just under an hour. We'll keep this fluid. <laughs> we don't have, you know. There we go. I'll start with Chris, just who's the closest. Okay. Uh, my name's Chris Baker. Um, I was a uh, conceptual designer on Eyes Wide Shut. Um, that's it, I was a conceptual designer on Eyes Wide Shut. <laughs> I'm Abigail Good. Um, I was a, did you say I was a principal dancer? I was a dancer in the um, in the infamous orgy scene. Um, and sort of halfway through filming, I was given the part of the mysterious woman. Uh, so one with the big parts. <laughs> <laughs> Not a mystery anymore. Nathan, I was the choreographer for the last all disrobing scene. <laughs> Oops. So I'm Kira Ann, and I was creating CG visualizations of the film sets within the art department, and I got a little bit involved in also taking some location stills. So all within the art department early on. First of all, I feel very unimportant, and I am. <laughs> um, I'm very honoured to be here, and very grateful to be invited. So thank you very much. And I've enjoyed listening to everybody's talks. It's all been quite insightful. Uh, my name's Tim Everett. I work with a very nice gentleman who sadly passed away a few years ago called Steve Southgate, who is Vice President of Technical Operations for Warner Brothers. I was Director of European Technical Operations for Warner Brothers. So between us and the whole department, we did all the distribution post-production work on every film at Warner's from about 2019 98 to about 2007 or thereabouts, including Eyes Wide Shut. Uh, and as such, it was that's at the time it was just another film that went through the system. Um, but I know Steve and Julian Senior, um, and Julian sent me a message. Would you like to read it out? Yeah, um, or later. Yeah, um, yeah good. Uh, Chris wants to say something. Yeah. Like yeah. No, I, I, I just wanted to add something to the conceptual design thing. I didn't conceptualise the audio sequence, unfortunately. Um, there were specific sequences. It was the costume shot and the dream sequence, which was never in the film. So, yeah. Thank you. Whilst you're um, looking for that, I'm just going to throw out the first question. Um, most of us here are just academics, and most of us, not all of us, or archivists, <laughs> uh, or students, and um, we just read the text. Not all of us, I know. What I want, for those of you who, who worked on the film, uh, to give us sort of one key insight that we can't get from just our textual analyses and, and that you think we should, we need to know. Uh, you read out the... Uh... Right, so this is from Julian Senior, who was the uh, Senior Vice President of Marketing at the time, and probably and dealt with standing on a regular basis every day. So this is what he said. He called me at home on that fateful Saturday in March and chatted on endlessly about all sorts of things, from Tom and Nicole to the England rugby team. I finally said, Stanley, this is getting boring and I'm very tired. Okay, came the reply. I'll call you tomorrow, but afternoon. Great, we'll continue the discussion then. He never called and I never spoke to him again. He died during the night. I always regret cutting that Saturday call short. I'm not sure I can bring myself around to reading the book, but I do know Nathan Abrahams is a very, very good writer and knows a great deal about Stanley's life and career. By the way, nice to see you. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just read out, I mean, I did invite some others. Leon Vitali was, I was very flattered by invitation. I'm sorry my response has been so long in coming because I've been trying to see if I can make it work. Um, I would truly have loved to be there with you all. As it is, I can only wish you the best. What should be an enthralling time. I'm sure you'd agree that Stanley is truly an unquestionable source of curiosity, deservedly so. But I'm going to hand this microphone over to you. Really? You, plural. Um, <laughs> to answer my question, or, 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 or not. And um, I'm expecting loads of questions from the audience. To you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still thinking about it. See, I just about, okay. 
Uh, so what I would say is that it was um, it was quite an organic process. I felt you know there was um, <coughs> script changes. I sat in on script changes. Stanley asked for my opinion. I mean I was just a you know I was just a, a dancer. Um, but um, it was interesting watching the process and the flexibility in which direction it could have gone in and how they weren't sticking to the script. They were writing the script almost as they were going from, from what I saw. Um, I don't know if, if, did you have that experience? Did you notice anything like that? <laughs> Gosh, I, um, well, I mean, people have heard quite a lot from me already, but um, I'm, I mean, what's, well, right now, you know, after these two days, what's extraordinary to me is my head is exploding because, you know, just so many different lenses through which people are uh, uh, perceiving and analyzing and uh, trying to kind of, you know, uh, you know, understand this film. Um, and so, you know, putting myself back, trying to put myself back into the process 23 years ago, um, almost, um, it's kind of quite hard because my heart feels pretty full, but I think Actually, what you said, Abigail, is, is really, um, it really strikes a chord, you know, that, you know, after all these analyses, you know, when it came down to it, it was, it, being inside the process was incredibly immersive and, um, and, and, you know, very sort of organic. I mean, it, it was a process all the time of, of discovery and, yeah. and, 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 and changes and, and, uh, um, and exploration and repeating and finding something else and then, you know. Particularly with our scene. Yeah. Because we rehearsed for months, mm -hmm. didn't we? And we came in with one thing and came out with something completely different. And we have the conversation of, is that what they always wanted us to do? Mm -hmm. And they were just getting us used to the idea or did that come about during rehearsal? Did mm -hmm. they suddenly decide, well, actually, let's make it. Because as far as I was aware, that was that was meant to be a dream sequence. So the choreography, the choreography was meant to be, you know, quite dancey and, and balletic. Is that is that correct? From is that yeah, I mean, well, surreal. Yeah. Like it was meant to be like uh -huh. surreal, and we ended up, of course, you know, people simulating sex, which is not mm -hmm. surreal at all. Um, but the process was that always the what they wanted, or did they come to that conclusion while we were? rehearsing and Leon would come and record everything we did and he would take it back to Stanley and then Stanley and then Leon would come back and say okay well Stanley we'd like you to try it like this or we'd like to try this and by the end of like I don't know how many months it was but in the end he just came back with pictures of the Kama Sutra <laughs> and went Stanley would like you to try that so we just went what, what so he just wants us to basically simulate sex and you know, we were all a bit shell shocked because that's we were we were you know <coughs> models with the best agencies in London and there were ballet dancers and that's really not what we signed up for. You know, it, it isn't. And um, but I was just saying to Lander, by that time, we knew each other so well and you know we'd had body contact. I would always rehearse in like swimsuits or bikinis or whatever. But mm -hmm. we were like mates, so it didn't seem that shock shocking. And I think everybody just put it to the back of their head and just went, okay, they want to simulate sex, but let's just get through this um, this sequence in the circle. And I think everyone was like, well, what do we do then? Are we just gonna say, no, we're not doing it and running a mile. And we just blocked it out and went and went on to set and, and did it. Um, but yeah, so the organic process of coming into something as a professional dancer and ending up, you know, Dancing. <laughs> it's a bit weird. Um, but it's Kubrick, you know, so I think there was also a sense of, you know, it, it, it's a Kubrick film, so it kind of made it okay, in a way. Yeah, I mean, I don't even know, you know, because I, I, I left um, after the last ball scene, um, partly because I had a production lined up that I didn't want to postpone again, and also because I didn't really want to choreograph people having sex. And so I don't actually even know if, you know, how many of the models that were work, working in the, that were in the, the circle were ended up in the orgy. I don't know if they, and I know there were obviously awesome. more. All of it is, <laughs> wow. Much, yeah. Wow, yeah. I hope you were paid better. Um, <laughs> you, you just reminded me. 
reminded me of something mm -hmm. I think I told Nathan, uh, which I don't know if it's in the book, I haven't read it. But um, Leon, uh, and you may have been involved in this, uh, Leon came to our office in Broadwick Street, where the Warners, Warners had two offices, one in Wardour Street, one in Broadwick Street, one somewhere else. They're now in Hoban, and the Broadwick Street office is now being demolished to turn it into something new. Um, and that office had a company flat on the top floor for the visiting heads of Warners and whoever else might be. And uh, Leon needed somewhere to do auditions, which is all part of that process, because we had to set up the whole room. That's why I came You came to that. Yes, I thought you might have done. We had, as a younger man, I've got to say, looking at the uh, ladies that turned up to the, um, the office during the time, I was quite impressed. <laughs> Uh, but yes, and I remember all sorts of people. I think Anna Friel came in. There was all sorts of people coming through the door and going upstairs. I know it was all done proper though, because of the, the way we had it set up at the time. So there was no, there was nothing. Yeah, I mean, I've got something to process. add to that. So <coughs> I, I went to do that audition through. I think I was with IMG. It was like one of the big agencies in London, and I ended up leaving my agency and going back to the Midlands where my father lived, and. It must have been a month. Um, and I got a phone call from a little agency that I sort of started off with in Manchester called Boss, who rang me up and they went, do you remember going to an audition for uh, Warner, Warner Brothers? And I said, yeah. And they went, well, they've been looking for you everywhere. Because I'd left my agent, they couldn't track me down. And they found me with this little agency up in Manchester. And they'd, I mean, Stanley wanted natural bodies. He didn't want enhanced boobs, did he? Yeah. he yeah. It was his yeah. thing. Like It had to be his version of perfect, to the point where they tracked me down <laughs> through another agency, which is so bizarre when you think about, I don't know how many girls they saw, but they lot, saw a lot. a lot. Yeah, they yeah. saw a lot. He was and, there for months. And yeah. weirdly, actually, I watched the film recently with my partner, and actually looking at the bodies now, and you look at today's version of perfection, they're not actually perfect bodies, are, are they? I mean, I don't know, maybe they're, they're, they're perfectly natural bodies, but um, I don't know, for me, when I looked at them now, I was like, gosh, you know, if that was made today, girls would, would be like it, Disney yeah. characters, you know. Um, what is perfect? What, what is perfect, it was, it, but it was his version of perfect, right. and he wanted what he wanted, and he didn't stop until he got it, you know. Can I bring Kiran at, um, at this point, actually? <laughs> Um, because yeah, yeah. I mean, do you want to explain the role you had? Because it's um, quite an unusual one, and uh, what you did on it, and how you got there. That's yeah, I, I, I think the so in terms of how I got there, that I uh, um, what I was working with film sets at that time, creating these visualizations, and to get a role, you would get uh, um, there's a little paper that was distributed that talked about. Um, what films were being made, and it named the designer, and to typically to get that job, you would just ring up the designer and say that you were looking for work and were they trying to hire you. But for Eyes Wide Shut, just Stanley was listed, or perhaps Warner Brothers was listed. So I think I got in touch with Warners and tried to find the name of the um, production designer, and they wouldn't release it. And that may have actually been because there wasn't one at that point, and one had been fired. Um, but they said, you know, contact Stanley. And I said, well, of course I'm not going to contact Stanley. That's too ridiculous for words because I'm just not part of the system. I said, well, just, you know, email him anyway. Not email him, obviously not email him. Write to him anyway. So I wrote a letter and then got a phone call back. And I actually thought it was a hoax. So I, I got a phone call from the producer of the film and I uh, was asked to go to the house. Went to his house and, and uh, saw these Range Rovers outside. And I thought, oh, that looks a bit film industry. Maybe this isn't a hoax. Um, so then I was brought on to work within the art department, um, actually at a point when the designs hadn't started, um, I think somebody recently been fired, and was creating these CG visualizations, and that was, uh, it, it was quite a tricky thing to do actually at that time because the art departments were very, very traditional, and they liked uh, uh, drawings, and they liked uh, sketches, and they liked little um, polyform, polyboard models, and they really didn't like um, sort of the, the future that Stanley saw, which was going to be much more of a digital and operative future. And they were always trying to get me to go and uh, chamois up their cars or make them little boiled eggs and toasties rather than do what Stanley had asked me to do. So there was a bit of, sort of conflict in the art department at that point. Um, but to come back to your question about what did the two things, my, my takeaways actually. So I had two takeaways from that experience. And one was, um, and I think both of these would be very obvious to people thinking about, you know, or just, I, th I think you would have, I guess this 
already, but uh, was, was something about Stanley's kind of power and charisma. So everybody that I worked with, both within the art department, the very senior heads of department, um, really behaved around him as though he was very much a charismatic um, kind of cult leader. People did things that I've never seen people do, senior heads of department on any other film. They back, you know, generally people act, I think, in much more normal ways with colleagues in, in film, with directors and, and producers, and I've worked again with some other well-known uh, producers and directors, and I've never seen that before. And then the other thing that really struck me on that film was um, the level of, uh, um, kind of Stanley always wanted to choose from lots and lots of different ideas, and it sounds like maybe some of that went on with the choreography, that mm -hmm. he wanted to see every option mm -hmm. before choosing one, and just that level of um, <coughs> really trying to find you know the very 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 best to make sure it's absolutely perfect and he hasn't missed any option when he's when he's choosing so i thought that was very interesting yeah i'm, I'm gonna bring chris in um how did you get involved um in, in the film and um, you all know what you did but you can say it anyway yeah uh, well my involvement was without <coughs> being sure um came through working with stanley previously with the uh, artificial intelligence which was ai back then I mean, I, Stanley contacted me in 1993 to work on AI, and I started work on that in 94, spent the next year working on AI, and then I was actually looking at the drawings the other day for Eyes Wide Shut, and I thought I was, I'd only been on it for like a couple of months, and it was like six months I was sketching for that. But the, the first day, I think, is the first of the third, 96, which was March, and the goes into August and I don't remember starting on it that early but basically I've been working on AI and one morning Stanley rang me and said um, I'm just sending you through some pages faxing through some pages for this other thing that I'm working on I can't remember what he actually said whether this project he was thinking about or whatever and he sent me a bunch of pages and it was Eyes Watch Up and he wanted me to take a look at the uh, it's possible, well, I suppose it was a definite dream sequence <coughs> at the time, and the costume shot. So I kind of got just got drafted onto Eyes Wide Shut, but I don't know if anyone wants to hear how I actually got involved with Stanley what, in the first place. What was the dream sequence then? Oh, it, was, it was actually going to be uh, Nicole Kidman's dream, and it, I, like I say, I had to go through the drawings again yesterday to see what it was all about because there was a specific thing that Stanley wanted and it was of uh, Tom and Nicole basically fucking on a horse and that was the, the core of the dream plus uh, Nicole's because as she describes in the film there's hands all over and I just started doing these very fantastical sequences and I look at them now and think, where the hell was I going with this? I mean, I, I don't know if people have looked at this stuff in the archives. I mean, I seriously think, what the hell was I thinking? Um, I mean, seriously. Did he give you a lead? Well, yeah, well, well, I had some notes because it talks about the naval officer and it describes him coming out of a forest uh, approaching Nicole. And I, I actually did that, just sketched it in a very normal way. But then with my screwed up brain, I just turned them into these incredible, totally over the top fantasy sequences. But I just kept on doing this for months and months on end. So I don't know whether Stanley liked them or thought, what the hell is he doing? Let's let him, you know, sort of like riff on this idea. But the interesting thing was the number of sketches that I actually did of them on the horse. And uh, we did talk about the logistics of a couple actually having sex on a horse, you know, and which way round would be best for Nicole. <laughs> I mean, there's so many different versions. I was in my element, to be honest. <laughs> I seriously was, because I mean, I've done a lot of erotic art on, or sort of architecture on um, artificial intelligence. And I think Stanley just thought, well, I'll give it to Chris. And yeah, and I, I look at it now, and I'd love to actually my sensibility now, I would love to do it all over again. Because um, there are so many ideas that I wouldn't attack now for that dream sequence, but it probably still wouldn't end up in the film. Because it, it was totally excised from the film, and I understand why. Because I think the film has a dreamlike quality anyway, and I think to add this really 
sort of bizarre dream sequence. It didn't need it. Well, that's what I wonder whether that's why. Well, I wonder whether that's why he pulled the sort of surrealism from the dance that it wasn't necessary that everything had a dreamlike quality anyway, and it would have made it look false. This way, you you're left going, is it a dream? Isn't it a dream? Like, was it real? And by us not being ballet lifted, I suppose it takes that element out and leaves you asking. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting hearing you, Chris, because that really parallels my experience. I'm sort of glad I'm not the only one that worked for months and months creating things that never ended up in the film, you know, which but, I was, you know, and, and, and also just coming to terms that that was, I was just another kind of little cog in a big, huge, you know, machine kind of churning things out, you know, and for, you know, sort of creating this, you know, was just uh, instrumental in creating this kind of broad palette of possibility, you know, that then he could sort of decide, you know, if, you know, when it came to the moment, you know, when, when it was a, he was about to shoot that, he could go, okay, I'm gonna have this, this, you know, this version, you know, um, but um, I was gonna say something to you, yeah, but, but I mean, actually the, the movement, the dance that we, the, the little vignette choreography that we made, they weren't, they weren't, even though, you know, you were lifted, you know, you were, there was a lot of lifting, and rolling, and curling, and caressing, but it wasn't ballet. It was, it was contemporary, it was very contemporary. It was contemporary, yeah. didn't it? Some of the, the male dancers were, were ballet yeah. dancers. All the dance, all the, the male dancers we worked with were, were trained, either yeah. ballet or contemporary, or both dancers. And all the women were, were models, and um, you, Abigail, were the only one that had any real <laughs> movement quality. I mean, you actually were sort of set the bar pretty high yeah. for the others because the others didn't have any kind of movement training. Um, and I'm very glad to, to know that after working on that, I inspired Abigail to go and train <laughs> to be, you know, a movement. So that's nice, yeah. you know, that uh, something more came out of training to be a movement uh, yoga instructor. Yeah. Which, is, so, um, which I'm not so. anymore. <laughs> do, do, we have any, do we have any questions? Any, uh, um, um, Bill and then Matt. Um, is there a microphone? This is why you need to sit at the front. <laughs> Sometimes you can see more from the back. I'd like to ask a question about the importance of the storefront as almost a character in this movie. Um, <clears throat> I was reminded when I went to the uh, archives of stairs uh, that had a number of the pictures of, of storefronts that Stanley Kubrick had made, in fact, I read he had photographs made all over England of storefronts. And the set is a series of storefronts, sort of with the theme of how do you sell yourself? And I thought about this over the years, and um, I, the concept comes from the criticism and the appreciation of 2001. People have often said, sorry about my voice, <coughs> people have often said Kubrick managed to capture the essence of future ness in 2001. You see it moving in 2019, it still feels like a future. And the people were seeing it in 2004 still felt like a future. Future Ness. So I often thought, in a way, among many other things, Eyes Wide Shut is about shop Ness, S H O P Ness. And the essence of it. There's so many different shop fronts, like, for example, Verona, in Fair Verona, where we lay our scene, the opening of Romeo and Juliet. But this is a quick question for Chris or Tim or any of, anybody here who could talk to the importance of the shop front as a character for him uh, in this movie. No, I can't. I wasn't involved at all with it. I just did the interiors of the, the costume shop, but I wasn't really privy to any kind of exterior sets or anything. So, I mean, Kira, you did this. Yeah, I wasn't really that involved in any shop fronts. I, I think I did some visualizations of the costume shop interior, um, but shed absolutely no light on that theory at all. Uh, they were just visualizations of the interior and there were no, I wasn't involved in any big discussions about what they meant. Um, and then Manuel photographed, Manuel Harlan photographed the, uh, the street scene in, was that Mile End? Commercial Road, yeah. Commercial Road, yeah. Commercial road. Yeah. so I wasn't involved in it either, so I had nothing interesting or useful to say about that. The shot fronts you're referring to in the photographs were location, um, looking for locations, because originally it was going to be shot in London, um, right. actually in London, <coughs> um, as opposed to on set. Um, the person who would know most, who I did invite, um, I couldn't make it, Lisa Leone, who was brought on as um, initially to take photographs in New York, Vivian asked her as a, as a, as a favor, and then um, she was hired full time and, and actually appears in the film as, as Bill's receptionist. Um, 
So for me, I mean, I'm sorry, I don't work on the film, but I'll shut up in a sec. But the, the Joseph Krybish Bakery, <coughs> uh, and we talked about this, this bakery that Bill and Domino stand outside um, is an is a exact replica of an existing knishery on, um, in the Lower East Side, not in Greenwich Village, called um, Joseph, uh, Joseph Schimmels, um, uh, Jonas Schimmels. And um, I, I just heard that he had, he had eventually had all these shop fronts shot, hundreds and thousands of them, mm -hmm. not for location searching, but for designing a set. The problem with that is he's shooting British shop fronts for an American. Yes, it's very yeah. interesting, but nonetheless, the idea of shop fronts is. No, no, it's a nice idea. It's like facades, it's another form of mask, isn't it? Yes. Uh, and how do you sell yourself honestly or truth in advertising kind of thing? Because wasn't there an issue with the costume shop, Kira? If I remember, they were going to shoot it on location. Were you involved with this? Didn't you do some designs on the uh, Rainbow Fashions? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So clearly he didn't like... He found a place in Finsbury Park, but clearly didn't like it because he had you mock up the interior, didn't I, I, he? I just, to be honest, I just remember mocking up the interior, and I can't remember much more about why or what happened to that subsequently. You have to buy my book to see some of the images <laughs> um, um, uh, that Kiran kindly uh, lets us use. Um, uh, into it. Um, Matt here had... Um, Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so I have a question about breasts. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I was very interested in something you said yesterday, Yolanda, uh, about that uh, process that Kubrick had of photographing women, almost anatomizing them, based entirely on their physical appearance. Because uh, I think there's precedence for this. If you go back, I mean, I've looked at the casting notes and lists for Coco Orange back in the, and, and he has female casters at next to which he's annotated them and rated them according to their, 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 their uh, attributes. So, and I was wondering, sort of, uh, uh, Abigail, um, how you responded to that, 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 that process? Uh, how, how was, that, was, that, was that an uncomfortable process for you? Or? What, being naked? Well, no, being kind of anatomized in that way, because you're like you know, saying yes. I was, I was 28 when I did this film, yeah. so I've been modeling for, yeah. you know, I started modeling at 16. Um, I mean, I had a good body, so I would, you know, I'd shoot like Marks and yeah. Spencer's packaging and like swimwear for Freeman's catalog. So, you know, I was used to, yeah. you know, that was my job. Yeah. I was used to being paid to, you know, for my appearance and for my body. So. I don't think any of us really felt. Was it was a big problem? Not really. No, it was our job. I was going to say because actually Yolanda and I were having a chat about the aesthetics of that scene yeah. last night. And as an artist, um, I am also a sculptor. I mean, yeah. I'm a figurative sculptor, and I understand totally the process that Stanley yeah. is going through. And it is purely aesthetic. It is objectifying. Yeah. A shadow. It's not. It's not objectifying women as such. It's objectifying everything in, in filmmaking, yeah, yeah. and sort of like not. having all those models the same height. The and if you look at the um, the way it's lit when they're in the circle, it's like a downlight it, and just the way that the breast throws shadows, mm -hmm. and the way the head throws the shadows yeah. here, the length of the neck. It's all those little minutiae of yeah. detail that makes a difference, yeah. and even the way the the light. Uh, you know, hits the the stomach, things yeah. like that. That's really, really important. Yeah, totally. And it's it is objectifying yeah. the form as opposed to objectifying a woman. And it, it, it all kind of makes sense to me. You know, the only reason I was asking because you, you said yesterday you felt a bit uncomfortable with it, and I was wondering if that was just a general thing. But that's a good answer. Thank you very much. Um, Can I just say we we never it never felt like we were. Yeah sexual objects either. I mean, we were treated with the utmost respect. It was a close set, you know, they yeah. would ask us if we were feeling comfortable, uncomfortable. It was, it was very respectful. I, um, I had a sort of practical uh, question uh, for Abigail um, about um, her performance. And um, so the dialogue was laid on afterwards in ADR. And um, I was just wondering if um, when you performed, um, when you were acting, uh, 
were you speaking under the yes, mask or, yeah? Yeah, so um, it needed to be in American, and I'm yeah. English, and I didn't have an American accent, so um, you'll see, like you can see the throat moving, except certainly in the hallway scene at the end when I'm warning him to get out. You know, yes, I, I properly acted for those scenes and, and had to learn the script. Um, and I think the dubbing was the only thing that was done after Stanley died, wasn't it? That's the only thing he didn't do himself. And, and was the dialogue I know that. different? You, you know that, don't you? Yeah. The dubbing yeah, he was done yeah. post yeah. Yeah. his death. Yeah. Um, and was it different than the words that you said? Did, had it been changed? Pretty or? much. I, it was identical. Right. Yeah, it was identical. I mean, I would have loved to have stayed the voice, but you know, I didn't. You know, I didn't have an American accent, so that was never going to be, unfortunately. Also, I think the practicalities of uh, people speaking with a mask on wouldn't have. Uh, yeah, I suppose um, they the must have had to. Yeah, they must have had to dub all all of the uh, yeah all of the scripts where they were having the mask on. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've always thought that sequence was slightly expressionistic <coughs> sound-wise. That I don't know what someone speaking through a mask would be like yeah. in that setting, mm. not having been in that kind of setting. And I just thought it was deliberately expressionistic. It's kind of heightened. When he says, from the moment he says Fidelia, it adds this sense. You're saying maybe it's dreamy. Just the sound sounded quite well, it's not, very not quite close. right, but in a way that like fit the. And just incidentally, if you do in the archive, there is um, Kate Blanchett's, do uh, Kate Blanchett's doodlings and, and notes about motivation um, as she was recording the lines, um, sort of scribbles on a piece of paper where she sort of, um, I can't recall exactly what's written. Um, so it's worth coming back and checking it out. Um, uh, uh, so, Rod. Yeah, I, I've got a big loud voice, so I'm <laughs> Um, you've, you've probably answered this already, so if you don't have anything to add. Um, but I am interested, given the nature of the orgy scene, how you feel you might have reacted in the Me Too era, i.e. not recalling how you felt then, but how you feel now about it. And do you think it would have changed? Would you have called it out? Would you have, is that something you would have called, stopped, drove through the line? <coughs> What? Oh, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't in the orgy scene. Um, it is something we were chatting about outside. I um, I had no experience of that whatsoever. It was everyone was completely respectful. Um, but I did have a journalist speak to me recently and ask me a direct question that somebody else had suggested that something like that had gone on. My response to that was. As far as I was concerned, I just don't think that's possible. Like, I spent quite a lot of time with Stanley in the end, and he was like a father figure. He, he was he was a lovely, lovely man. I can't imagine anything like that ever happening. And I don't think, apart from maybe this one person who I won't, I'm not going to start naming names, because um, <coughs> it came via a journalist, but I think one person has suggested that something, a, a Me Too moment, but I think she was just embittered of the person. Did, did you mean though the representation? If if you were if if the thing, film was being <coughs> now, regardless of the fact of whether you were treated well, um, but the the, na the actual content of the film, the nature of the film, I mean the you know the the subject matter of the film would would being in a film with that subject matter in the context of you know the world now and the Me Too movement and the Epstein thing. I mean if it was literally now, you know would that change your you know your I don't think so, and I think films like that are being made all the time, aren't they? I mean, way more provocative than this. I mean, actually, this seems dated compared to what gets made now. There's a question in the middle. I don't know. Uh, quick question on distribution. Mm. Um, Kubrick yeah. always seemed to have a reputation with previous films uh, of being tightly in control of distribution, but, or at least taking a very active role in it, in, ter in terms of getting the advertising, making sure of where it was playing. Did you have very much involvement from the estate, as obviously he wasn't around every day, <coughs> well, every day from before, and then there was a feeling that we had to honor his process, I think. Right. So we carried on 
like he was still alive, if I remember rightly. Uh, the answer is yes, he would have talked to Julian about all the marketing every day. And before the film was released, I reckon they had a final, they knew what they were going to do. Right. Um, and that also applied to all the film that was made. Um, everything that we made at Deluxe was run through the lab and every single reel was viewed as it came off the printer and either accepted or rejected and we probably had a 50% reject rate right. and half of them got dumped in the bin and were then burnt in Enfield. Yeah. Uh, by the way, along with all the videotape that was ever made of all really? the, all, yeah, we had to, we absolutely had to go through the whole process of making sure everything Why? that was sensitive, sensitive <coughs> was destroyed. Anything that was current was destroyed, but it wasn't the negatives. There's, there's lots of negative and there's lots of trims and spares all stored, but anything sensitive like the, 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 the takes and anything Leon made in our office, I know because I had to buy a degauss and I was physically degaussing tapes all day long from him, <laughs> buying him tape stock in order to film the next thing. And then we had, went and crushed them, and we, we wow. degaussed them and then we crushed them. So I know none of that exists because we were told, you can't, you know, this mustn't go out the door. And uh, Warner's is very much the same now. Christopher, anything with Christopher Nolan, you don't even stand on the stage and say Christopher Nolan, because it's so sensitive that a small portion of information will get out. And Stanley was probably one of the first to do that. Right, okay. Thank so you. he was very much in control. Okay, thank you. And pass it back to Jay, and then we'll talk to Lawrence. Thank you. So uh, a lot has been made during this conference about the lineage of the film as beginning sort of as a comedy, right? We're casting Woody Allen, possibly in the role of Bill. Um, and to me, the, the funniest scene in the movie is possibly the costume shop scene, right? There, there's a lot of like real comedy in that moment, which audiences who are totally focused on the orgy like lose track of. They, they, don't, they don't laugh because they don't feel like they're supposed to laugh. But there's a weirdness to that scene. And I wanted to ask about designing the costume shop and about uh, building that space. Um, what sort of, where did you find inspiration? Um, and it's such a weird costume shop. It's not like a costume shop I've ever been to. And so, sort of, where, where's the surreal, surreality of that costume shop coming from? Um, yeah, I did a lot of costume shop designs. Um, some very, very straightforward, simple. I mean, it, it goes back to the whole thing of giving Stanley a catalogue of everything that he could possibly want, but and hoping that you know you hit the mark. Um, I think it's just the, with me, it's just a, a matter. I think a lot of my sensibility came from working on AI because I had such leeway with that film. I was given such a, a free uh, role imagining these spaces. And I did exactly the same thing with the costume shop. And some of them I've designed almost like mazes, like chess boards, and some of them were almost like the TARDIS. You'd walk through the door, and you'd walk in, and they were sort of like 30 feet high. And I had lots of very moody down lighting and up lighting, very film noirish, and I just went totally over the top, again, like the dream sequence in a way, because I just wanted to cover every single face. Um, but ultimately, it comes down to a very small moment in a way with the, I guess, you, if you want to call them the transvestites and, and, the, and the girl. And I did think it was a very odd kind of scene because I did so many drawings of these two guys in wigs and, and the girl. And sometimes they, they would, the three of them were together, and in other shots, she was running towards a bill um, and, um, and, or, and whispering into his ear and it, it was very bizarre but it, it's just a matter of kind of letting yourself go and I, I wish I could actually remember the conversations that I had with Stanley at the time but this is like it is 23 years ago and <laughs> my brain cells are going quite rapidly rapidly anyway I mean I did make a lot a lot of notes on, on the images um, but it, it, it's just a matter of kind of expanding your brain a little bit and thinking outside of the box. Um, and because I would, most days I would speak to Stanley, I would fax the illustrations through, this was the days of faxing. And we'd have a conversation at the end of the day and talk about it. Um, and it, it get, it's interesting to see what I actually did 
and trying to equate the conversations that I had with Stanley to what I actually ended up doing. I mean, obviously, in the end, the in the finished film, it is quite a relatively straightforward place, isn't it? It's quite. I mean, in terms of its look. Yeah, it's 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 not. It's not weird. Uh, over it. No, no, no. Yeah. I've just run the costumes down the side, and it's a quite a narrow, long shop, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I did lots of very, <laughs> very tall, very, I mean, uh, actually, a lot of the sketches, I'm really, really pleased with, I look at them now, I thought, that'd be really cool in a movie, mm -hmm. in another kind of movie, yeah. and um, so, yeah, I mean, it, so, I mean, you, you've asked the question, what is it you're trying to eke out of the question, in a sense? I mean, I think you answered it, it's yeah. just uh, th this idea that, the co for me, the costume shop isn't like the costume shops in America. Yeah. Right. And well, so, it definitely isn't like. Right, and, and so just yeah. a, it's it's something that both is familiar and yet very strange. It's quite uncanny. But I suppose maybe the strangeness is more due to the action that happens in the costume yeah. shop in a way, because it is very bizarre. Yeah. The lighting is <coughs> quite blue, isn't it? The lighting yeah. in there—it's like a waxwork medium. It's like quite haunting. Mm -hmm. that, that yeah, I mean, I think when I was doing the sketches for it, I played around with lighting probably more than anything else. It, it, again, it kind of goes back to uh, what I was talking about with this kind of sculptural quality of the, the female form, is that with flat lighting, uh, a set you know, doesn't give you much, but as soon as you start throwing in interesting lighting, all of a sudden it comes alive. You know? And that's what I've played with the most. I mean, I don't know if you want to I can't, there's that. not much I can add to that, I'm afraid. So yeah. was it, but was it, you may know, was was it based on a real shop that we then... Well, I think we can pretty much say, I was going to say, um, 20 years ago, that's probably what a costume shop looked like. Now we get them on Amazon, right? So we don't need um, mm -hmm. good looking costume shops. What the in Hendon look like? That's where he got his costumes for the shiny. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I mean, what I suspect he did, um, and I... I is that he would have done his research, his location research. And, and it probably is based on either a real or a composite of real costume shops. I, I don't think it would have been entirely... Yeah, he, I don't think he liked doing composites very often either. So, like, the I mean, composite in the sense of The Shining Hotel was based oh, okay. on lots of real... Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. It, you know, I, I'm just using that as an yeah. example. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I bet it was probably based on a real one. Now, there's this one in Hendon, uh, not Hendon, Finsbury Park, that he looked at. But I, I, I haven't seen the pictures of what the interior looks like. Really? Oh, I five. Five. There's no costume. No, we were talking 20 years ago now. 25. 20 years ago. <laughs> it was a flat there. <laughs> I'll find you the address. Um, Lawrence, had a, <laughs> Lawrence had a question. Um, where's the microphone? Well, one is to Abigail, the other is to Chris. Uh, I'm curious to know, but I, and you may not know this. Uh, he was very curious about your character. You wrote a whole lot of questions to Professor Wisely, asking who are you, why do you want Harper, why do you sacrifice yourself? And there's an issue whether the sacrifice is a show in or whether you actually sacrifice yourself. So my question is, was any of this shared with you in your discussion? My question to Chris, is that there's only one black person other than for pedestrian in the whole movie and Kubrick specifies that it be played by a black actor which is the mortuary I think. I mean how many black people work for Stanley and are you <laughs> I work from home. <laughs> I wasn't I was I, that was actually you know given the stories that I hear about you know people actually working on set with Stanley in, in Stanley's vicinity. I mean, I, I was in my studio at home in Birmingham all the time for two years. Um, so I don't know uh, if there were any other black people working on that film. I mean, you guys would know better than me. You were there. None that I saw. I know that, that there, were, there were several, um, during the audition for the dancers, there, were, um, there was one in particular that was a black, um, beautiful model, or da I think maybe dancer, I mean, there was a few. And they were just discarded without <coughs> at them. Actually, can yeah. I kind of respond to that as well? Because it, 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 this goes back to, again, what we were talking about last night, the aesthetic yeah. of the, the orgy scene with this, you know. I, I can understand, I mean, I, I suppose people can come at it with various 
ways, attack it in various ways. You could say it's racist because none of the, none of the, the models were black. I think aesthetically, to have had a black figure or black figures in there would have actually spoiled the aesthetic of the thing. It's about the, the way it's lit. Uh, because if you ha if you have a row of white figures in a black one, all of a sudden that that black figure kind of disappears, and the way that it's lit, it would have to be lit in a totally different way. And so I am kind of defending. Stanley in a way by saying it was the aesthetic of having or like for instance I would say suppose that uh, scene was set in an area that was lit totally differently and it was white marble I would have nothing but black models in there. and that's a different kind of aesthetic so I don't know I mean I, I, I was just gonna say behind the scenes and I think the film industry is very much recognizing now that there's a problem with diversity behind the scenes certainly in trying to do something about it at that time, Stanley would have, it was unusual that I was recruited by Stanley directly, and he would have only recruited the heads of department. Um, and probably at that time, that there weren't many, there wasn't, there really wasn't a lot of diversity in, in terms of the heads that he would have had the option from. And the heads would have then hired their own departments. I don't think he could be held responsible in any way for recruiting. You know, I, I think there was a problem in the industry at that point that's only now been addressed. Yeah. I mean, I was actually involved with a documentary some years ago while I was working at the point with, um, what was I working on, I can't remember. Oh yeah, it was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And uh, I think it was the BFI uh, produced a documentary documentary about you know, ethnic minorities in the film, British film industry, and they interviewed me for that and a few other people. I've never actually watched it, because I hate watching myself back anyway. And, but you know, things are changing. I had a conversation yesterday about, it, it's, it, it's all sort of like, by osmosis, things will change. They won't change overnight. Like, for instance, one of the things I discovered when I was working in Los Angeles is that most of the top storyboard artists are black, and no one knows why. You know, I mean, seriously. I mean, it's it's a really it, the percentage is really high. It's like, how did that come about? And but I do think that you know, it's um, again, I don't want to defend. There is obviously a hierarchy. There is racism and whatever. Um, but, you know, I don't want to go into it too much. We can, that's another conversation in a way. Um, but what, why did you ask that question? <laughs> I, I mean, it's, shall we say, all these things go together, sexism, racism, anti-Semitism, all uh, cluster, they all correlate with one another. It's yeah. not the other, the outside there. You consider the dominant ethics. So, and there's an issue about that. And, all the issue of one man ordering all these women around and orchestrating it is very much that theme. So you can read that as being the dominance and these women serving them. So that is, that is a view of that scene. Um, Abby, he had another question. Do you want to? Yeah, the question about the sacrifice at the end. Yeah. Um, so you're probably aware there was a role change yes. uh, halfway through filming. <coughs> which threw a bit of a spanner in the works, and there was a lot of conspiracy theories about, well, you know, is it meant to be the same girl? Um, the answer is, I think that the, the girl whose part I, I took over was due to her being a bit difficult, and I don't think there was anything else in it, but what it did do was make people question and look and go, well, they're not the same girl because their bodies are completely different. Mm -hmm. And spin out all of this, well, was he, did he mean to do that? You know, did he mean to put a question mark in people's heads? You know, this is what's quite interesting about Kubrick, just a decision that he made practically could make a bunch of academics sit there and ask a million <laughs> questions <laughs> about what he meant by it. Um, in that, so in that instance, um, who knows, maybe that is what he wanted to do, but uh, I, I think it was more out of practicality. So was she um, sacrificed? Was he? Were they just trying to scare him? I think so, yeah. Um, as time's getting short, I'm going to give the final question. I was going to say someone who hasn't asked one, and then Miguel's thinking it's going to have the, the leap home. Um, but I, I don't want to speak for the panel. I, don't, I think we'll be around for informal chatting. Are we? <laughs> um, um, but, yeah, briefly. A short question to Chris. And if you know why Kubrick asked you to do a conceptual design for the costume shop, I mean, I can understand why to do conceptual design for the dream sequence, or why the costume shop, which was 
pretty much a standard transition scene or why not the mug, for example, the mug scene? Yeah. Good question. <laughs> I, I guess I was just, in a way, I was on hand. I'd been working with Stanley for over a year and he, we developed a relationship that was pretty good, you know, um, that he knew that if he asked me to do something, I could come up with designs pretty quickly. And I think it's basically that. I mean, it did surprise me that it was something as relatively, I guess, mundane as that. But um, I think the, the job of a, a designer anyway is to be able to design anything. You shouldn't be pigeonholed into doing something. Were you specific. the only designer in, in that respect? Well, I doubt it. I mean, I, I'm sure that, you know, I mean, I, in, I, like I say, I, I work from home on my own, and I'm sure that there were other designers. I mean, obviously. There were other people involved. Well, there was production designers, yeah, but you, I think we're the only yeah, artist person yeah. doing, as far as I'm aware, the concept art. Really? So, there was no one else in the art department doing concept? No, not concept art. I was doing visualisations, which yeah. sometimes would have people in them, mm -hmm. um, in positions, but not, that was something to Yeah, it's them. interesting actually, because I mentioned it earlier, because I've been on uh, Art Workshop for six months. And then I, they actually wanted me to actually come into the studio, come to the house, and actually start working there. And I thought, oh God, this is going to go on a bit longer than I thought. <laughs> um, and I was on my way there, and my then in-laws lived not too far from where they, they were. And and then I, I got a call from Tony Fruin and said, oh, uh, no, forget it. And I have no idea why I was basically ditched. I actually went back onto AI. Oh, right. I mean, the interesting thing about it is that when um, Stanley started, I was obviously focused on um, Eyes Wide Shut. I mean, I was still <laughs> working on artificial intelligence. And I remember one of the last conversations that we actually had was that, you know, um, I'm going to work on this film, Eyes Wide Shut, and then once I'm done, we'll get back to AI. And it, at the time, he was thinking, well, maybe a year or so, year or so from now. And obviously, it went on for another three years. And then, in And it's one of those things that I, I wonder what would have happened, you know, if we had he lived longer. Because, uh, you know, it was one of the, it's, it's one of those experiences that changed my life totally. Yeah. We were all saying that. Mm. Totally mm. changed my life. I got a film career out of it. You know, I've done sort of twenty-five films since then. I think it is now, and then went on to work with you know Steven Spielberg and Sam Mendes and Tim Burton. And it's like, and it, it was a happy accident that I even got involved with Stanley in the first place. You know, he just happened to see a graphic novel that I'd been that I worked on the year before, and it had been published maybe six months before. You know, he contacted me. The interesting thing is that I remember uh, hearing on, I think, it was, I can't think, it would have been film, you know, remember the Barry Norman film program, and I think it would have been film maybe 92, possibly 93. And he and as I was standing, Kubrick's working on this science fiction film called AI. I thought, God, wouldn't it be great to work on that? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's like, yeah, it was bizarre. And the, the, another weird thing is that when a, my last year of school, I didn't do art. My art teacher said, because he knew that I liked drawing comics, and he said, oh, don't bother doing art this year. Just do comics. And I actually did an adaptation of 2001 Space Odyssey. <laughs> so it's like really, really one of these Twilight Zone moments as well. I think my biggest regret, my biggest, one of my biggest regrets, is not getting Stanley to sign my copy. Oh. Of the, of, no, 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 not, not, no, not the artwork. He, I didn't get him to sign my copy of the making of 2001. I don't know if anyone knows that book. It came out yeah, in some yeah. this really chunky thing, book that I wore out as I was doing this adaptation. Of, you know, the, the shots of this the discovery. It was just, yeah. Oh, I'm rambling. <laughs> <laughs> you're not. You're not. We're just. Um, we're just. Um, uh, out of time, I'm afraid, at least uh, from my perspective. But can we just uh, thank our panel for the. <laughs>